Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's MinMD Real Talk webinar, When ED Pills Don't Work, What's Next? My name is Austin Hunt, and I'll be your moderator for this event. I work on the marketing team here at MinMD, and I'm excited to be hosting this session today. Before we get started, we have a short disclaimer that we need to review. The health and medical information provided during this webinar, as well as the questions and responses from the webinar providers, are solely for informational purposes. This content is not intended to take the place of advice or treatment from health professionals. Nothing presented in the webinar is intended to be used for medical evaluation, diagnosis, or treatment. It is not intended to substitute for your relationships with your own healthcare and pharmaceutical providers. Always seek the advice of your healthcare provider before beginning any new treatment or if you have questions regarding a medical condition. All right, with that being noted, I'm pleased to introduce today's presenter. Dr. Amy Perlman. Dr. Perlman is a fellowship trained men's sexual health urologist. Her practice focuses on the restoration of sexual function and urinary control, voiding dysfunction, and the evaluation and treatment of hormone deficiencies and is located in Iowa City, Iowa. Today, she's going to cover the underlying causes of ED, medical treatment options beyond pills, surgical treatment options, and then hold a live Q&A to close out the webinar. But before I hand the mic over to Dr. Perlman, I have a few housekeeping items to cover about this presentation and the MinMD Real Talk webinar platform. If you're joining on your laptop or desktop, you'll notice a control panel to your right. If you'd like to minimize your control panel, click the orange arrow at the top left of your control panel. If you're joining on a mobile device, your controls are at the bottom of your screen. As an attendee of this webinar, you've joined in listen-only mode. If you have a question for our presenter, please feel free to send it through the questions tab in the webinar control panel if you're joining on your laptop or desktop or in the bottom tab if you're joining through your mobile device. We'll be answering all questions at the end of the session today. I'd also like to thank those of you who submitted a question with your registration. We'll be answering those questions first during the Q&A session. So without any further ado, I'd like to kick things off by welcoming our presenter, Dr. Perlman, over to you. Thank you, Austin. Is this thing on? Just kidding. It's just a prep. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for the introduction, folks. My name is Amy Perlman. I'm a urologist, and I specialize in quality of life concerns that affect everyday men. Tonight, we're going to focus on all the different treatment options for what we call erectile dysfunction. And the good news is that there are very few men in whom we can't restore function. Thank you to those of you who submitted questions in advance. Y'all asked really good questions. And I'm actually, I reviewed the questions and, and I'm gonna try my best to answer as many of those questions while I'm going through the actual slide deck. And then at the end, after I do a short demo session, I'll go through on my phone the remaining questions and answer whatever I did not have the opportunity to address during the presentation. Hey, Austin, why don't we kick off tonight's session with some polls? Sounds good. First poll coming up. All right, the first question here. How long have you been experiencing ED? And All right, the so the majority have been at least a year and uh, most at least three years. All right, next poll. All right, next question here. How many treatment options have you tried? One, two, three, or four or more. And it looks like kind of all across the board from one to four or more. I think we have one more question. Is that right, Austin? Yep, one more. All right. Yep. All right. Have you attended one of our previous MinMD Real Talk webinars? So we hold events all throughout the year on various topics ranging from VEDs, injection medication, and this one as well. Awesome, about half and half. So welcome back to those who have previously ten attended one of the webinars. And for those of you where this is your first time, I mean, you're ahead of the game in so many ways. You know, unfortunately, most men never come in to seek help for these types of concerns. And so we congratulate you on taking that first step. In order to understand dysfunction, we first have to start by understanding normal structure and function. And we'll begin by talking about the basics of the erection process. When a person is aroused, the nerves re release uh, nitric oxide and that nitric oxide re um, uh, ultimately leads to smooth muscle relaxation and allows good blood flow to go into that penile tissue. Now, let me show you an example of what that penile tissue actually looks like. And if you see this sponge here, 
this spongy tissue here with all these kind of openings, that's exactly what the penile tissue looks like. Then there's this tougher area of tissue that surrounds the entire erectile bodies. That's what we call the tunica albuginea. And so when someone gets an erection, you have blood flow into this spongy tissue. You have relaxation of this tissue that engorges with blood, and then it pushes on these veins. And when those veins collapse, you get a buildup of pressure in the penis, and that pressure should stay in the penis. So when there's not enough good blood flow into the penis to engorge these sinusoids in that spongy tissue, or perhaps there is good blood flow in, but those veins leak too soon, then that person may describe you know, their erection as only being able to get partially erect, or perhaps they can get the erection, but they can't maintain the erection for a sufficient period of time. Erectile dysfunction is kind of a vague term for, for an erection not lasting as long as you want, but we do have some more specific you know, definitions here. Um, the persistent inability to achieve and or maintain an erection adequate for satisfactory sexual intercourse. Now it's important to, it's important to note here that whenever I ask, whether it's my friends or my colleagues, not to say that I ask all of all these types of people about their, their sexual function or erections, but nobody can perform at 100%, 100% of the time. Now, it doesn't mean that a person who, let's say, can't maintain an erection on a Friday night after drinking some alcohol has erectile dysfunction. Everyone is gonna have their own degree of not being able to maintain an erection for however long they want. But you know what, it's incredibly common and you can't expect yourself, and, and, and if you're a partner on the call that's supporting your, your male partner, you can't expect them to be able to perform all of the time because simply nobody can. And erectile dysfunction is really common. In fact, uh, it occurs in one in five men uh, in America during their lifetime. And also over 50% of men over the age of 40. So we're not even talking about, you know, necessarily guys in their 70s, 80s, 90s. We're talking about the age of 40 will notice some degree of erectile dysfunction. And I certainly see this often in my, in my office. You know, I'll see guys coming in in their late adolescence and 20s, all the way up through their 90s with some degree of erectile dysfunction. Now the etiology or the causes for the erectile dysfunction may differ, you know, between that 22 year old gentleman and that 70 year old, but it certainly can affect men of all ages. When it comes to the most common causes associated with erectile dysfunction, number one and number two are gonna be heart disease and diabetes. And if you think about it, I mean, it makes sense because in order to get that good erection, remember in this sponge, you need good blood vessels to be working to relax and accommodate more blood vessel flow. So heart disease can be, it encompasses a wide range of, of problems. And it could be as simple as uncontrolled blood pressure over a long period of time. It doesn't mean that you have to have end-stage heart disease or cardiomyopathy or, or, or you know, requiring blood thinner medications. Um, it could be as simple as high blood pressure that doesn't, that is not well controlled over a period of time that can be a leading cause for a drop in sexual function. And then diabetes, man, diabetes just wreaks havoc on the blood vessels and the nerves. And when we go back to that physiology of to be, to be able to get the erection, you need those nerves to work to actually um, to, to release nitric oxide into the system. And so if those nerves aren't working because they were damaged from diabetes, then again, number one and number two causes are gonna be those two reasons. Other less likely causes, but certainly ones that I see all the time in my office are gonna be from medications, anxiety and depression medications and blood pressure medications can certainly contribute to a drop in sexual function. Um, prostate medications, uh, neurological conditions like Parkinson's uh, can have a higher risk of causing erectile dysfunction and certainly endocrine problems. Not to say that uh, low testosterone or putting someone on testosterone is a treatment for erectile dysfunction, but if you have low testosterone, it's pretty difficult to get a good erection in that type of state. So a lot of different reasons to have a drop in sexual function. And oftentimes it's not due to one single reason. In fact, it's probably due to, uh, you know, a little dot in each of these areas of this, of this uh, pie chart right here that's contributing to a drop in sexual function. 
Now, let's talk about some of the therapies and we'll briefly go through oral medications. Um, this topic today encompasses a, pretty much all the different treatment options and so it can get a little bit overwhelming. And um, the good thing about the Men MD webinar series is for additional information on any of these treatment options, you can actually go to their site and click on prior recordings of these different webinars to really get into the details of each of these individual therapies. But we will go through each one of these briefly. Oral medications are effective for the majority of men. So whoops, over for about 70% of men, the pills will work, it will work. And so that's where we typically start when a guy comes into the office, unless there's a reason why we can't use the pills. And, and one big reason, like no, no, for using the pills would be if someone carries around a medication like a nitroglycerin. So let's say someone gets occasional chest pain and has to put a sublingual nitroglycerin, you know, underneath his tongue, then we really, it is a contraindication, a big no-no to give that person an oral medication for erectile dysfunction. But that's really the, the main one there that would prevent us from using the pills. Otherwise, I'll say in a majority of situations, we oftentimes start with the oral medications because they're non-invasive. These medications, there are actually four FDA approved medications for the treatment of erectile dysfunction, Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, and Stendra. Stendra is the newer kid on the block. Whenever you have a newer medication, it also comes at a little bit of a higher cost. And so for that reason, I don't often prescribe that medication. Levitra is going to be a little bit more on the expensive side as well. So at least in my practice, I'm typically going between something like Viagra and Cialis. The big differences between those two types of medication, Viagra doesn't uh, sticks in your body for it to work for up to four to six hours, whereas Cialis is a long-term medication. So that can stay in your body for it to work for actually up to 36 hours. Some people might refer to that medication as the weekend pill. They might be able to take it on a Friday night and it might still work for them on a Saturday night with the caveat that these medications um, are not perfect for everyone. And you know, if you think of, oh, 36 hours, that sounds awesome. It may or may not work for you in terms of that time frame. I have some people that say they take something like Cialis and it, it takes a while for it to kick in and they're not getting the erection until the following day. Some people who say those medications work for them to, for good erections for up to several days afterwards. So sort of take that with a grain of salt. Um, in terms of, you know, other reasons we, why we may not serve these medications, you know, on this slide, it says if you take alpha blockers for high blood pressure, I will say we have a lot of our male patients on alpha blockers for enlarged prostate tissue or BPH, and it's not a reason why I wouldn't be able to put someone on an oral medication. I would just want to make sure that that person were stable, that they had good fine heart rate and fine blood pressure on that alpha blocker for a period of time. And as long as they did fine and didn't have any major side effects in terms of dropping their blood pressure, then it's perfectly fine to start someone on something like Viagra or Cialis. Um, and in terms of taking oral medications, you know, with cardiac conditions, you know, most of our patients who come with erectile dysfunction have cardiac conditions. The key thing there is going to be that nitrate medication. Some folks take a nitrate every single day and, and certainly not in those guys, you know, they would not be candidates for oral therapy. Now, side effects of these types of medications can include facial flushing, nasal congestion, blurred vision, headaches, heartburn, back pain, or muscle pain. Um, with these therapies, if you, if you have side effects from the medication and you take them on a few repeat doses, then oftentimes those side effects will get better. And so you may find that they're not as bothersome. In terms of efficacy of these different medications, there's no research that says that one necessarily works better than another. I have some patients that say they prefer Viagra and others that say they prefer Cialis, either for the side effects profile or for the efficacy. Same thing with side effects. People may tolerate one better or worse than another. And that's just another reason why you might wanna try several of these oral therapies. In terms of generics versus brand names, they have the same you know, active ingredient. So I've definitely had patients say, well, the brand name works better, the generic works better. And I certainly believe those guys. I'm not sure why that's the reason, um, but that might be another reason why you try either the brand or the generic version. Um, I will say that the generic is gonna be uh, significantly cheaper than the brand name. So those are typically the ones that I prescribe for my patients. 
Other points about oral medications is they don't work for everybody. And I don't want you to think that you're a failure if you're one of those guys where the oral medications don't work. In fact, I would bet that most of the people on this webinar tonight uh, have tried oral medications and they're not cutting the mustard. That's why you're here and trying to learn about all these other options. And that's okay too. Um, the reason why some men uh, you know, don't have uh, effective results with oral medications can be from a variety of reasons. And if you have diabetes and it's been uncontrolled for a period of time, or you have bad heart disease, then the oral medications just aren't going to work as well as in someone who doesn't have those underlying medical conditions. Um, and then if you're on other medications, sometimes it's like I'm in the office talking with a patient and they're on, you know, like five medications that ha have known sexual side effects and they have heart disease. And it's like, you know, is, are the medications really going to work in that person if we're kind of fighting this uphill battle of five medications and other underlying problems? And, and for those guys, maybe not. Um, but as we'll talk about further along in this webinar tonight, there are other options for guys like that. The other point, too, is that, you know, if you've had, let's say, prostate cancer and had your prostate removed, those nerves that sit on the prostate are really important for erectile function. And depending on the type of disease that you had and where it was located in your prostate, if your surgeon was unable to peel off those nerves from the prostate and spare the nerves, then you're going to un uh, unlikely uh, get efficacy from the oral pills because you need those nerves to function in some way, shape, or form to release the nitric oxide to actually get an erection. So if I see a guy in the office and I know he had prostate surgery, he wasn't able to have a nerve sparing approach, you know, if he still wants to try the oral medications, it's not going to be harmful, but it may not work in those types of guys. All right, so we briefly went through the oral medications. I'm gonna go into the other option. So the title of this webinar is when the oral options don't work and that's where we'll spend the, the majority of our webinar time this evening. So let's talk about who can treat erectile dysfunction and a lot of people can treat erectile dysfunction. And these are just three right here on this list. So a general practice provider or a family doctor can certainly treat erectile dysfunction. In fact, they probably treat the majority of erectile dysfunction and only a minority or small subset are actually gonna get referred to a urologist or an ED specialist. Urologists are, are trained surgeons who specialize in the genital and the urinary system. The important part to keep in mind here is that not all urologists treat comprehensive erectile dysfunction, meaning there are some urologists who might only feel comfortable prescribing different oral medications. They may or may not talk about vacuum pumps. They may or may, talk, they may, or may not talk about injection therapy or penile implants. And so don't make the assumption that just because you've been referred to a urologist, that that person will offer all treatment options about erectile dysfunction. Um, it just, as urologists, we all sort of have our own things that we like to talk about. And some urologists uh, talking about erectile dysfunction for whatever reason just isn't their jam and that's okay. So if you're seeing a urologist for erectile dysfunction and you feel like that person really can't get into the nuances of how to treat your erectile dysfunction, you should really ask for a referral or self-refer to somebody who can really provide that specialized care. A prosthetic urologist or ED specialist or, or people like me who have gone for additional training uh, specific to men's health. And, and we are, I will tell you, we are probably the most passionate bunch uh, of, of doctors out there that um, have really dedicated our careers to helping men like you uh, reach their maximal potential when it comes to sexual health. And so, you know, prosthetic urologist really refers to implanting uh, something like this, a penile implant, which we'll talk about a little bit more uh, into the erectile tissue, um, but it's one of many therapies that we have to offer. All right, so let's talk about, we spoke about oral therapies. Let, so let's get into a little bit about the intraurethral gel. Now, all these medications, just briefly here, they increase blood flow to the penis. So same thing with oral medications, and then we'll go into the gel here. The nice thing about the gel is, and I don't have a demo product with me, but there's no needle. So that's a plus, two thumbs up there. Um, you self-insert this medication uh, into the urethra. That's the tube that you urinate out of. So 
So in my demo here, the penis is made out of three erect or three uh, tubes, two erectile bodies that fill with blood during an erection, and the urethra, that tube that you urinate out of. And so you would just put this applicator into the tip of the urethra here and inject that medication. Now the onset for the erection is gonna be usually within about five to 15 minutes. Another pro of the gel is it doesn't take quite as long to take effect compared to the oral therapy. The oral therapy, you know, for something like Viagra, you wanna give it at least 45 minutes to an hour to take effect. So there's some timing involved there. Uh, whereas with the intraurethral gel, we're looking more at five to 15 minutes. In terms of efficacy, well, it's more effective than the oral medications, but less effective than the penile injection therapy. Common side effects include urethral pain or burning with application and perhaps a prolonged erection. There are different formulations that you can use to inject. Um, and this is one of the therapies that MenMD offers on their site. Now, in terms of mitigating side effects or, or making them sort of less of a problem, make sure that you're using proper insertion technique. Some offices, depending on where you're getting this medication um, or who's prescribing it, may have you bring in the medication into the office to show you how to do your first dose, or they may have you do it at home, depending on the clinic infrastructure. You want to start with a low dose and then slowly titrate up, titrate your dose up as needed if you're not getting a sufficient erection. Um, and then you don't want to use it any more than every, you know, once every 24 hours or so. And certainly for, for this medication, you do need to keep it refrigerated. I would say a little tidbit from my practice, I don't commonly use the urethral gel medication. A few reasons here, they tend to be more expensive than the other therapies and they don't work as well as the injection therapy. So for those two reasons, you know, at least in my practice, not a big thing that I use, but I certainly have some patients and actually recently prescribed through the MedMD site for one of my patients. All right, let's go to penile injection therapy. Now, when I mentioned this type of therapy in the office, nobody says, hey, Perlman, I love it. Thank you so much for offering this therapy. But I would say, I think a lot of people are surprised at actually how well they tolerate penile injection therapy. Now, this medication, or at least some of the formulations are actually very similar, if not the same, to the medication you put in the urethra. It's just a different way of administering the medication. It works by self-injecting the medication directly into the erectile tissue. And just like the intraurethral medication, it doesn't take quite as long to take effect compared to the oral options. And the onset of erection is going to be within five to 15 minutes. As I briefly mentioned before, it's going to be the most effective non-surgical treatment for erectile dysfunction and success rates are gonna be pretty high. Side effects include priapism or that prolonged erection. And the key thing here is, is to start at a really low dose and then you slowly work your way up on the dose. You definitely don't wanna just jam in you know, high dose of this medication because that will necessitate an emergency room visit requiring another injection or removal of the blood from the penile tissue itself. So that's really important to start at a very low dose and to slowly work your way up. Other reported side effects, and, and this goes to some of the questions and concerns that people were raising when you pre-submitted your questions, include penile fibrosis or scar tissue formation, hematomas, so that's a collection of blood if you hit a vessel, pain after the injection, local infections, and curvature. I have a good number of patients who use penile injection therapy. I've definitely seen the penile fibrosis. That can be one of the reasons why for penile injections, it, they might work great for the first few injections or for the first several years. And then you may notice that they don't quite work as well, or maybe they stop working several years later. And that can be if scar tissue uh, develops, then it just may not work as well. But you may notice too, with the development of scar tissue, that the penis doesn't stretch as well as it used to. It's like, we go back to this sponge analogy here, you know, if this tissue right here, if it's nice and stretchy and pliable, then when blood flow goes into this spongy tissue, this tissue can really expand. But let's say I put like some 
like literally some concrete, you know, on the top of the sponge here, and then I fill the sponge. Do you think this tissue is going to expand? No, it can't because scar tissue doesn't expand like normal healthy tissue. Uh, the hematoma, you know, usually like if you accidentally hit a vein on the side of the penis, you might notice some oozing of blood or a small collection uh, of blood forming, in which case you just want to hold pressure perhaps with, you know, your finger, or a tissue paper, an alcohol swab until the bleeding stops. The pain with inject, you know, either during injection or after injection is oftentimes from one of the medications that's in the formulation. Um, and that medication is called alprostadil. And that, that medication is known to cause like a dull ache in the penis. And that might be one reason why we switch around the formulations of some of these injectables because of that pain associated with that medication. And curvature can happen if you do develop some scar tissue. Scar tissue doesn't stretch. So if you have scar tissue that forms in the top part of the penis here with an erection, the penis may curve up, for example. And I'm going to show, after I finish with the slide deck, I'm going to show some demos of how to actually do the injections on a model. In terms of side effect mitigation, important to use proper injection technique. Depending on who is prescribing this medication, they may have you come in the office for your first dose and perhaps have you come in on, you know, for several office visits afterwards to understand, you know, to titrate up your dose slowly. I'll say in my office, I, I don't even do a test injection in the office, although it's um, probably the safer thing to do, but we don't offer combination therapy in our office, so I wouldn't be able to inject our patients anyway. And so I order from a compounding pharmacy and my patients just, they're, they're instructed to start at a very low dose and slowly work their way up and they actually do quite fine with that. Um, you want to try to rotate the target injection site. So if you inject it on a Sunday on the right side of the erectile tissue, then try injecting on the left side the next time that you do it. And we oftentimes recommend that you're not injecting, you know, any sooner than every 24, you know, to 48 hours. We want to limit the amount of scar tissue uh, that can form. And so not really something we would want you to do every single day. Um, and then this medication as well should be uh, refrigerated or put in the freezer. Let's talk about vacuum erection devices. I had a patient recently, I was recommending this device for him and he was like, oh, like the Austin Powers thing? And uh, and yeah, that's pretty much what we're talking about here. And, and I wish, um, you know, we think about vacuum erection devices as, as things that are being sold at adult sex shops and they're kind of taboo. And, you know, my patient was asking, so like if something happens to me and my son finds my vacuum erection device in my drawer, like what's he gonna say? And I told him, I'm like, it's for penile rehabilitation. I mean, that's really where it plays a role in my practice. I, I certainly have some guys who use a vacuum erection device prior to sexual activity, but I've become a really huge proponent of men using vacuum erection devices to help stretch out their tissue as part of a penile rehabilitation program. One of the questions someone had asked was, what is the best product for a vacuum erection device, and there is no best product. You know, one part is, is how much are you willing to spend? I would say probably shouldn't get the cheapest one that's available on the market, but you probably also don't need the most expensive product. Um, probably, you know, somewhere in the middle. And then it's just deciding, do you want a manual one? And I'll show you an example versus one that's battery powered. Battery powered ones tend to be a little bit more expensive, but there are certainly some cost effective options available on the Men MD site as well as sites like Amazon. So this vacuum erection device, and, and I will demonstrate uh, using an actual product, is a hollow tube. You place it over the penis and either you use this manual lever or you use a battery powered pump and it physically sucks penis, or sorry, it sucks blood into the penis and stretches out that tissue. Now, if you were to use the device and then just take it off without using a tension band, then the erection will go away. But that's how I recommend my patients use the device if they're, if they're using it for penile rehabilitation, is just to use it to help stretch out that tissue, keep the suction on for a couple of minutes if they can, and then take Take the device off. Now, if you're using the vacuum erection device prior to sexual activity, then after you pump, after you, you use the device and you get good blood flow into the penis, you'll actually move a tension band onto the base of the penis to keep the blood in once you remove the actual device. Patient satisfaction rates uh, vary from 68 to 80%. I'll say for my penile rehab patients, I think a lot of people are actually happy with the device because they see in real time that their penis is stretching. 
And I recommend penile rehabilitation therapy for anyone who's no longer getting regular erections. So not even just our guy to have had prostate cancer and have had radiation or prostatectomy. If you're 50 years old and let's say have heart disease, or maybe you don't have any you know, medical comorbidities and you're no longer having nighttime and or morning erections, you know, I do recommend uh, a therapy like this, a vacuum device to help stretch out that tissue on a regular basis. It's kind of like, um, if I were to lift dumbbells and, and lift my biceps, and let's say I did this, you know, three times a week for six months, and then all of a sudden I just stopped lifting weights. And then you were to, you know, I were to flex, let's say six months later, and you were to look at my muscles, you'd probably be like, Perlman, what happened? It, you clearly stopped exercising your arms. And I would say, yeah, I haven't worked out my arms in, in six months. And that's the same thing that happens with the penis. If you're used to getting regular erections when you're younger, and then all of a sudden you stop getting erections, that tissue is no longer stretching on a regular basis. So let's say we're able to restore function. Let's say we put you on Cialis or we put you on injections and you're able to get an erection again. I just see so many guys who say, that's it. I swear, Dr. Perlman, I, I was bigger before and I believe you, it's just your tissue here. This spongy tissue hasn't been stretched out for a long period of time. And so the tissue changes and it doesn't stretch as well as it used to. So vacuum erection devices, I can get all my patients to you to get a vacuum erection device and combine that with any one of these other therapies, I think a lot of people would be happy with their ability to maintain length and girth over time. So you can go to the MenMD site to look at some instructional videos. I think uh, for people who say that maybe their vacuum erection device doesn't work or they're not happy with it, I think for a lot of people, it's either they didn't get a good device or they're not entirely sure how to use it. And so that's really the key thing there is to make sure you're getting a good device and you're using it appropriately. Um, in terms of using a vacuum erection device, if you're on blood thinners, I have some patients who do just fine and they're on blood thinner medications. You certainly can, or might be at higher risk of having, you know, um, of some bruising of the penis, but I wouldn't say it's a contraindication or a reason, you know, why you cannot use a vacuum erection device. All right, and let's move to penile implants. So penile implants, and I'll show a product here, are simply put, it's just, it's replacing the hydraulics in the penis. So those two erectile bodies that sit next to each other here, so whoop, like that, um, we measure in the operating room the total length of those erectile bodies, and then we customize the, the size of the implant to fit your body. Um, and some guys will say, well, Perlman, like put in a bigger implant, like do me a solid. And, and the response there is we really can't oversize the implants um, because if you put too much pressure on the tip of the penis where, you know, these sit right here, it's going to, it's going to hurt. Actually, it causes a lot of soreness at the tip of the penis. And there's risk that this, uh, this part of the cylinder here can actually pop out or erode through the tip of the penis. So whatever your body measures is a size implant that we can put in. Now, there were some questions that asked about, you know, do penile implants increase length of the penis? And the answer is yes and no. There are different types of penile implants. There are some that can actually stretch. And this device here is the LGX model, which stands for length and girth expansion. And the way that this material is woven allows, when you push this pump here, it allows fluid to fill these cylinders and this, this um, material is able to expand both in length and girth. The caveat is if I were to take this implant and let's say, you know, fill it with normal saline, salty water, just on my, you know, table right here in the air right here, this implant would really expand. The question becomes if I put this in your body, how much will your body, that tissue, remember this tissue here that surrounds the erectile tissue, how much will this tissue expand around the implant? So for guys who are really concerned about loss of length and girth over time, I think that penile rehab protocol using a vacuum erection device and any one of these other therapies, whether it's pills, urethral medication or injection therapy, even using that, considering using that before, when you're thinking about getting a penile implant, I think can help stretch out some of the tissue and it's certainly not gonna hurt. Um, and you know, once this implant is in place as well, I do recommend that patients cycle it on a regular basis, meaning 
every day as if, you know, like rehab is if you're getting a morning or a nighttime erection, you know, we want you to inflate your device when you feel like it's all the way full and you can't get any more in, let your hand take a break and then try to get a few more pumps in really to maximize the stretch of the implant. Then over time, and I've seen this with my patients too, if you regularly inflate the device, it's doing kind of penile rehab and stretching from the inside out. And if your body can stretch, you know, you can notice some additional length over time with regular use. In terms of deflating the device, it's a little button right here on this Boston Scientific implant. So you inflate it, you can't overinflate the device, it's not gonna blow up in your penis. When you can't push in any fluid, you just stop inflating it. And then you push this small little deflation button here, you squeeze the penis like a tube of toothpaste and the fluid goes back into the reservoir. And once I am finished with these slides, I'll do another demo and, and show you that more in a little bit more detail. Uh, there was a question that was asked about, you know, can someone tell that you have a penile implant in? For example, if you're in a communal shower and there's a lot of men around you, would they know you had a penile implant in? The answer is no. Actually, in, in the flaccid or the erect state, you would have no idea that someone had an implant in. During training, I was examining a gentleman in the office. He didn't tell me he had an implant in. He was concerned about some lesions on the penis. And so I was doing a genital exam and I was not feeling around the scrotum where that, where the pump sits. And um, I only found out he had a penile implant by looking at his CT scan, which clearly showed it, showed it. But on exam, you know, I specialize in this uh, and I actually had no idea he had a penile implant in place. In terms of efficacy, you know, a lot of patients are satisfied. A lot of partners are satisfied. The key point here is managing expectations before surgery. When my patients ask, is this a performance enhancer? Is my girth gonna get back to what it was? Is my length gonna get back to what it was? Uh, my answer is, I, I don't know, but what you can expect is your stretched penile length. So a good move to do is, whether it's tonight or, or sometime soon, is to, at your convenience, you know, stand in front of a mirror, put your penis on stretch, and that's what you can expect with a penile implant in place. Um, this doesn't have any effect on orgasm or ejaculation, really should not affect any sensation to the penis. If you've had your prostate removed or you're currently, you don't produce an ejaculate because of a prostatectomy, then doing this procedure will not then allow you to produce an ejaculate. But if you're able to orgasm, then that this implant should not affect that in any way, shape or form. It is a surgical procedure. So there are some people that aren't interested in having surgery. I would say surgery for any patient undergoing, it is a big deal in terms of all the different surgeries that we do as surgeons in urology and outside of urology. It's gonna be on the more sort of routine, less invasive side. For a lot of us who do these on a regular basis, it might take us 30 minutes to an hour and a half or two hours, depending on your anatomy. Um, and then some folks, some physicians will send you home the same day. Some people will keep you overnight and have you go home the following day. The incision, usually just one incision actually about that big in between the penis and scrotum. And we can um, either put it in between the penis and scrotum or right on top of the penis and infrapubic approach. And usually we can get all of the components of the device in through that tiny implant. Um, in terms of you know potential uh, you know other risks, you know historically people thought that there was a high risk of infection, and the reality is with the current devices out there on the market, actually the risk of infection is quite low and runs about one to two percent. Um, I kind of equate these to breast implants, although breast implants are are you know can make breasts as large as possible, so a little bit different in terms of the penile implants. But um, you know, some breast implants can can last in a body for a couple of years and then need to be replaced, and some can last for decades, and and that's really the case as well with penile implants. Um, they can malfunction. There can be a little bit hole that uh, hole that develops somewhere in the device. It'll just leak salty water, normal saline, so nothing that would cause any danger to you in terms of the leakage of that fluid. But it just may all of a sudden stop working, and you may require removal and then. Uh, placement of a new device, which is which is feasible um, most of the time. In terms of insurance coverage, a lot of commercial insurance companies 
cover the penile implants. Uh, Medicare covers 80% of the penile implants. In terms of state insurance or Medicaid, it really depends state by state. Um, in the state of Iowa, for example, Medicaid unfortunately does not cover the penile implants, but I've heard in other states they may. Um, and so you certainly want to check with your insurance company to see if they cover something like this. But over the long term, it can be a really cost effective way to treat erectile function. Uh, if you're thinking about the monthly, you know, fees of intraurethral medication or injection therapy, um, you know, a penile implant, if it's covered, you'll probably just have to pay whatever your deductible is. And then it depends on what your, you know, max out of pocket and how much you've, uh, how much you've met that year. But it certainly can save you money over the long term. For more information on penile implants, you can go to edcure.org. They have great videos on that site and they have great patient testimonials as well. This webinar was generously co-sponsored by Boston Scientific and they do offer a lot of different treatment options for various men's health concerns. And they're really a leader in the field when it comes to penile implant surgery. All right, so we are going to, let's see, we have about 18-ish minutes left. We'll do a quick demo and then we'll get into the remaining Q&A questions. Mm, let's see. Yep, you uh, just stopped yeah. sharing your screen, your full webcam, so you're good to go for the demo. Awesome, I met my milestone. All right, so, all right, we already know about the pill options. Nothing crazy here, just pills in a pill bottle. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll do the uh, vacuum erection device. And this product here, which is uh, sold on the MenMD site, is the Soma Therapy version. And so you'll get a case like this that looks like, I don't know, like a toiletry case, so it's very discreet. You have some lubrication that helps you get a good seal around the base of the penis. And then you have different attachments, which I think is a really great um, thing about this device in particular. This right here contains the battery. And so you would just fit this on, on the back part here, you turn that here, and then to get the suction, so this would be able, this would allow you to get that tension band onto the base of this device. You take this off, you put this around the base of the penis here, and then you would push this button right here, see that black button there, to start creating the suction. When you're ready to take this off, you kind of gently just peel it away like that to get the suction to go away, and you would take this off here. Now, so this is the battery powered option. And you also have the manual one. So in order to use this, you would just go like this to create that suction. This product also comes with a battery and the tension band. So these tension bands, you gotta try a different, you know, a few of these to see what works. The key is you want it to be tight enough around the base of the penis to actually keep blood in, in that tissue, but not too tight that it causes discomfort. So you can see the different sizes here. And this product come with, comes with uh, these bands. All right. Next option is gonna be the penile injection therapy. And so the medication comes in a vial like this. These are the typical syringes. They, the MedMD site also does offer an auto injector. But what I would do is, you know, you, um, whoop. I think I've probably used this needle before. It's a tiny needle, an insulin needle, but you start at a very low dose. Depending on the formulation, the concentration, the dose is gonna vary. So, you know, I usually start my patients off at 20 units, but that may vary depending on what formulation you're using. And then what you would do, so the neurovascular bundle sits up here. So a lot of vessels and nerves up there. So you don't want to inject the top of the penis. And then that urethra that you urinate out of is down here. So you don't want to inject the bottom of the penis either. So the sweet spots are going to be 10 and 2 o'clock. So somewhere over here, somewhere over here. And you want to inject towards the base of the penis rather than towards the tip of the penis. 
So I would clean this area off with an alcohol swab and I would very gently, perpendicular, if you can, the needle is so small, you can't even see this, but I would hub this all the way in the penis, slowly inject the medication, take the needle out and hold pressure there for a few minutes until, um, you know, to make sure that there's no significant bleeding coming out of that site. Then you wanna discard this needle in a sharps container, something like this, so you don't cause anyone any injury. And then this guy right here, he actually has a penile implant in and you would never know. So what you don't see here is this storage reservoir and this stores all the fluid and it usually sits over here in the pelvis. So you can't, you know, you can't feel it or see it. And then the pump actually sits usually in between the testicles. There's plenty of room in that scrotum to fit that pump. So you can't see it and uh, doesn't really get in the way of those testicles. When you want to get an erection, you just push this pump here and you're physically moving fluid or pushing fluid from this storage reservoir through the pump and into these cylinders. Again, you can't overinflate the device. I always recommend when you feel like it's fully inflated, give your hand a break get a few more pumps in really to maximize the stretch of that penile tissue. And then the erection should maintain for however long you want. When you want the erection to go away, you push a tiny little button right on top there, squeeze the penis here like a tube of toothpaste, fluid is moving from these cylinders through the pump and back into the reservoir. So it's a closed system of salty water. The other key point here is because this reservoir is stored deep in the pelvis, it's body temperature. So your body and, and your, neither you nor your partner can tell the difference between body temperature salty water and body temperature blood. So it doesn't feel any different. All right, well, that's the end of my demo session. I'm gonna just pull up my phone here and see if there are any remaining questions to address. Hey, Austin, anything while I'm pulling these questions up here and reviewing, do you want to talk about the new physician locator feature that's a really exciting new addition to your company's site? Sure. Yeah, we uh, so we just recently launched a uh, new physician finder program. Um, so if you're interested or if you're in the market for a new physician, um, so if you don't have a specialist currently and you're looking for a sexual or urinary, urinary tract health, um, specialist, then you can go on to minindy.com, uh, click the physician finder, uh, find a physician button, sorry, and it's going to take you uh, to our physician finder program, which will show you all of the physicians that are located near you. So go there. It's very exciting. We've, uh, we've been working on it for a long time, so we're really excited for it, and uh, hopefully everyone else likes it as well. Yeah, I would say, you know, when you when uh, you told me that you were offering that service, I think it's really important because you're helping in that way, you're helping advocate for patients to find a provider that can intelligently talk about all of these treatment options. You know, if a provider only offers oral medications, then they're going to make you go through Viagra and Cialis and Levitra and Stendra and all these medications. And that whole process can take years for some folks. Or I see some guys that say, you know, I tried Viagra, I tried Cialis, nothing works. Is there any hope for me? And my God, you can tell from tonight, there are so many other options. It's just that provider may not know how to talk about it or how to refer you to a specialist who does offer it. And so the fact that your company is helping patients navigate that process for them, I think is really important. Yeah, absolutely. And on this, uh, you can, you know, filter through insurance providers, um, as well as um, specialties. So, you know, you can really find someone who fits uh, what you're looking for and, um, you know, can work with you as well, to your point. Awesome. So let's see, in terms of oral medications, we did talk about how one doesn't necessarily work better than another and side effects are, you know, can differ depending on the medication. So sometimes it means, you know, trying a variety of di these different oral formulations. Um, I will say it depends on who your prescribing provider is in terms of mixing medications. I have plenty of patients in my practice who do mix the medications and they do quite fine. So, and, but just with the caveat that this is going to be off label use. So you do need to be made aware of that. Let me give you an example of how I may mix some of these oral therapies. 
let's say, you know, Bill is a 62 year old gentleman coming in and he has a weak urinary stream and has to strain to urinate, but he also has a drop in his sexual function. Cialis, if you take a low dose of that medication every day, can actually do wonders when it comes to urinary symptoms related to an enlarged prostate and improve sexual function. So in that scenario, I would probably put Bill on a Cialis that he would take every day. Now, now he can take it any time of day. I usually recommend that guys take it before bed just to help encourage as many nighttime and morning erections as possible. But the amount of Cialis that will build up in Bill's body over time will never be quite as high as if he took a high dose, let's say 20 milligrams on demand before sexual activity. So in his case, if it's just not quite enough to get an optimal erection, I might have him take an additional five or 10 milligrams of Cialis prior to sexual activity, or let's say he wanted to take some Viagra, maybe 50 milligrams on top of the daily Cialis he's already taking because the Viagra doesn't take quite as long to take effect, then a lot of guys can get optimal um, results actually combining therapy. Another question that someone asks is, is can you combine some of these other therapies? And yeah, you can. Uh, that's I think where we meet and research shows the best, uh, the best results. So for example, you can combine a vacuum erection device with any one of these other therapies other than a penile implant, meaning you can combine a vacuum erection device with oral medications. You can combine the vacuum device with the urethral medication or the injection therapy. I have some guys that say they get a better benefit when they use the vacuum device first and then inject the penis and others that say they inject the penis first and then use the vacuum erection device. So it's gonna take a little bit of trial and error and experimentation on your part to see what does the best for your body. Okay, hey folks, it's Q&A time. I'm going to respond to the most commonly asked questions that y'all asked. And let me just say, you all asked incredible and insightful questions. So here goes. When it comes to pills, I see questions here, you know, why don't Viagra and Cialis, why don't they work for me? And as we discussed during the webinar, they don't work for everyone, even though they do work for a lot of people. And the medications may not work in those who have had prostate uh, surgery, whether radiation or surgery for history of prostate cancer, especially if you were unable to have your nerves spared, which sit right on the prostate, as you need those nerves for the pills to work. Other things that can make those medications less effective are going to be heart disease and diabetes and other medications that you may be on. There is no evidence to say that one of these pills necessarily works better than another. I get the question all the time about, is there a stronger pill? You know, one point is, are you taking the maximum dose? And that looks different for each of these medications. The maximum dose for something like Viagra would be 100 milligrams, and the maximum dose for something like Cialis would be about 20 milligrams. Sometimes it just takes a little experimentation and trial and error to see which of these medications may work best for you. Can you take more than one type of oral medication at one time? You can, it's gonna be used off label and you may not see this on the packaging. One uh, situation where I might combine medications for my patients are because Cialis is a long acting medication and Viagra is a short acting medication. Let's say I have a guy who's on low dose daily Cialis, five milligrams every day, for perhaps some urinary symptoms as well as sexual health symptoms, but it's not quite enough to, to do the trick when it comes to sexual function. I might have that guy take a little bit of an additional Cialis, maybe five or 10 milligrams in addition to the daily dose or something like Viagra, maybe 50 milligrams on top of that. Let's see here, what else do we have? Let's see, when it comes to the vacuum pump, what is the best vacuum pump to buy? You know, uh, really you wanna pick one that's at your price point. There are ones that are gonna be, you know, maybe uh, $50 and others that are gonna be four or $500. You know, I tell my patients, you probably don't wanna get the cheapest one, but you probably don't also need the most expensive one. MedMD has a few options on their website at different price points. The key decisions that you're gonna wanna make for yourself are, do you want one that's a manual one where you squeeze a lever like this, or do you want one that's battery powered? I know MedMD uh, on their site has one where there's an attachment actually for both the manual or the battery powered attachment. And so you can decide what works better for you. 
But um, otherwise you want a piece of, I don't know, durable medical equipment that's gonna get you through the years and not one that just doesn't work or breaks easily. So it's like the same thing if you go to you know, Target or, or Walmart and there are so many options when it comes to a blender, probably one somewhere in the middle point there is the one to get. But there are certainly a lot of options. I see a question here about oral medications and injections, but how well do intraurethral gels or suppositories work? They're going to work better than the pills, but not as well as the injections. Muse pellets work, but are ridiculously expensive. I hear that all the time. Are there other options? Yes, there are other options. That's actually one of the areas where I use the MenMD site is because the, the urethral gel for Muse is, uh, is much cheaper than the pellets. And I think, uh, don't quote me on this, but I think it's about for at least one of the formulations, maybe $25 per syringe, which is way cheaper than what I've seen uh, that's commercially available. And you can tailor the formulation. So um, maybe not just the Alprostadil, but I know MedMD has other formulations uh, to get a little bit more creative with the therapies. Let's see, in terms of injections, a lot of good questions here. You know, a lot of the questions are, are surrounding the theme of, you know, I'm, I'm doing an injection and maybe it doesn't work all the time or it's inconsistent or it's been working for five years and it's no longer working. And that can be due to a variety of factors. And, and one might be the injection technique if you're not, you know, getting it in the right spot. It all depends too on, you know, if you're alternating sides and, and sometimes one side's a little bit more difficult to get good injection technique than the other, depending on what side, you know, dominant hand you are. I would recommend, you know, to optimize good injection technique is to do it in front of a mirror so you can actually see what you're doing. And if you have a body habitus where you can't see down below, then certainly doing the injection in front of a mirror or maybe getting some help from your partner uh, to help you out with the actual injection itself. You can get creative with that and make that injection process even part of some foreplay and have your partner say something like, hey, babe, I'm going to give you an injection and then we're going to get things going. Another reason why your penile injections may work one day and not another can also be due to stress. And stress can, the downstream effects, can, they send signals to your penis that vasoconstricts or doesn't allow those vessels that go to the penis to actually enlarge to accommodate more blood. And so if you're, you know, busy at work and, and you're, you're studying for, you know, um, I don't know, some big test or, or you're kind of just stressed out in general, that can certainly affect the efficacy. Of, of even things like penile injections. And then the other point too is, uh, is hormones can also affect your ability to get and maintain erections. And I have some guys who are on testosterone therapy, like testosterone injections, and uh, they've been saving to me recently for those who might be dosed a little bit longer out, maybe every two weeks, is their levels tend to go up in terms of testosterone, and then they tend to go down even towards like that 10-day mark. So the trimix or, or the penile injections may not work if your testosterone level is down, especially when you're nearing your next uh, therapy of testosterone, something else to keep in mind in terms of dosing regimen of testosterone if that's something that you're on. But it would also be something our, our national guidelines actually recommend when, when we as providers are seeing men for erectile dysfunction to check a testosterone level. And if it hasn't been checked, it would be something that you should ask your provider to check as both are very involved in the ability to get good erections. Let's see here. In terms of penile implants, another question I get all, asked all the time is, can they increase the size of a penis? And if we think back to the sponge analogy, and the sponge is so much like the penile tissue, if you don't stretch that sponge underneath a faucet for a long period of time, once you put that sponge back underneath the faucet, it just doesn't stretch as well as it used to. And folks, that's exactly what happens with the penis. It's like any other part of the body. If you don't use it, if it doesn't stretch out you know, over a long period of time, then the tissue changes. And once you restore function, it's not going to be as girthy or as lengthy as it was previously. And that's where a lot of these therapies, the ones that we've discussed on the MedMD site and elsewhere can be particularly helpful. If you're interested in penile implant surgery, and let's say you're waiting to get in to see a surgeon, or you just haven't made up your mind yet, or you're waiting for your surgery date, 
you know, that's an opportunity to rehab and, and really start stretching your penis to optimize outcomes when it comes to penile implant surgery. And not all surgeons will discuss this with patients. I don't always discuss it with my patients, but I do discuss it with those who are particularly concerned about the loss of length and girth that they've had over time is using something like a, a vacuum pump to stretch out that tissue as you're leading up until surgery. And then it's possible that, you know, it can stretch out that tissue enough that we can go a little bit larger with the implant. Um, but uh, that's where it, it certainly plays a role in my practice and can be helpful. The, that concern about loss of length and girth is, gosh, a concern of every man who comes into the office. And you know that every man walking around, you know, your city or wherever you're at um, has those similar concerns. And so my best piece of advice really is just to do whatever you need to do to get good erections on a regular basis, whether it's with injection therapy or pills or a vacuum pump, just to optimize the health of that tissue. Doesn't mean you have to use it for sexual activity every time you get an erection, but just for increasing blood flow to that area and adding some stretch. Let's see, how complicated and discreet is an implant? You know, surgery for everybody is a big deal. In terms of all the surgeries that we do as surgeons, it's more on the minimally invasive side. We have some surgeries that take up to 12 hours, usually for penile implant surgery, depending on who you're going to, you know, might take anywhere between 30 minutes, 45 minutes, two hours. If you have um, a lot of scar tissue in the penis, then not to say that you're not a candidate for a penile implant surgery, it just can be a little bit more difficult to get an implant in and to dilate that space. So it might take a little bit longer. Other factors that might prolong the amount of time it takes to perform the surgery would be if you've had prior pelvic surgery, let's say your prostate was removed or colon surgery or bladder surgery. Sometimes it just, it, it, we take a little bit longer to get that reservoir in that space if you've had uh, prior surgery in that area. But for the most part, you know, it, it, it generally takes between 45 minutes to two hours. Depending on who's doing your surgery, you might be discharged home the same day of surgery. Um, I keep my patients one night in the hospital. It's technically out, um, 23 hour observation or outpatient surgery, but I do send you home the following day. Um, usually our surgeons will keep a catheter in overnight and remove it the next morning. And everyone has their own regimens in terms of when they have you come back for, for a wound check and when they have you start inflating and deflating your device. Infection rates of penile implants are fairly low with the current iteration. The, the product that I use, the Boston Scientific product, the, you know, the infection rate is about one to two percent. So that's very low. Other risk of the operation can include um, you know, bleeding, just like with any operation, um, I usually leave sometimes, you know, depending on, on sort of how oozy the tissue is, I may or may not leave a drain in that scrotum overnight. Some surgeons always leave a drain. Some surgeons never leave a drain. Uh, it really all depends. And then device malfunction, you know, the follow-up data for penile implants are, are not great in terms of how long they last. A lot of the research is based on voluntary reporting. So if I remove an implant and put a new one in because it's no longer working, um, that may or may not go anywhere when it comes to when it comes to follow up and, and research outcomes. When they looked at a previous iteration of the device at, let's see, 15 years, 60% were still using their original device, and at 10 years, 70% were. I kind of equate this, you know, anything artificial that you put in the body doesn't last forever. A pacemaker doesn't last forever. Breast implants don't last forever. And so, um, you know, I have some guys who get many, many years out of their implants and, uh, and others who, after a couple of years, need a, a, a revision, a removal and replacement. And usually, you know, if it, if it just stops working, um, we can usually just remove the existing implant and put a new one in. Um, if there's a little hole in the implant, it's just salty water that fills the device. So normal saline, it's not dangerous. If that leaks into your body, your body will just reabsorb it. So, so no danger, no danger if, uh, if the device malfunctions in that respect. Uh, will I be able to climax if I get an implant? Yeah, you know, the implant shouldn't affect orgasm or, or ejaculation at all. Now, if you've had prostate surgery and prostate's removed and you're not forming an ejaculate, uh, which you wouldn't expect to be forming an ejaculate after that operation, then when this implant won't make you form an ejaculate, it, it really provides rigidity on demand. Uh, and is a reliable option. But, you know, if you're coming into surgery and you're not able to orgasm or ejaculate, then the penile implant really isn't going to change that. 
And orgasmic dysfunction can be due to a variety of reasons. And oftentimes I see guys who are on medications for let's say anxiety or depression and, and SSRIs are, are very well known to cause sexual side effects, including orgasmic dysfunction. So you want to make sure that you start addressing that even before surgery and continue to address that afterwards because the penile implant, you know, will not have an effect on, on orgasm or ejaculation if that's not happening beforehand, um, unless it's because you, you know, can't maintain an erection for a sufficient period of time. And so it's due to lack of stimulation would be an example there. Under what circumstances would the implant be preferable to trimix injections? Is the implant reversible? Another great question there. You know, it, at the end of the day, it just really depends on your quality of life goals. And when, if you're asking the question, well, I want the, the best option. Well, that looks different for everyone. Some people um, want a reliable and spontaneous erection. And, and for that, what, what natural and spontaneous means to them is they don't wanna have to go to the freezer or refrigerator and take out their penile injections and inject their penis and wait for it to work. Or it may you know, not be getting a vacuum pump and, uh, and using that to get an erection. And, and they, it might mean you know, pumping up an implant. And, um, but others will say, no, I, I don't want you know, salty water in my penis or, or cylinders. That doesn't seem natural to me. So I wanna maximize all other therapies before I would consider something like an implant. And wow, you know, everyone uh, is different. So I, I would never, you know, tell someone who's currently happy on therapy that uh, that they should get a penile implant because once you put a penile implant in, it's not like we don't just like willy nilly put them in and then remove them. In fact, you know, most of the time we're only removing these implants if they become infected, which is a you know very low risk for infection. But we would have to remove the implant in that case. Um, or, you know, that's really the big reason why we might remove it. it. It's rare that I see any prolonged pain at the tip of the penis, but, you know, sometimes that can happen with oversizing of the device um, or if it's, you know, inflated you know, all the time or partially inflated all the time, you can get pain at the tip of the penis. But otherwise, it's rare that I would remove the device. And, and once you remove the device, because of the, because of the intervention that was done when you dilate that space during surgery, is that that tissue tends to scar and, and scar tissue doesn't stretch very well and doesn't accommodate blood very well. And uh, so it would be rare that we remove this device. Um, you know, my goal at the end of the day when, when I'm meeting with any guys in my office is I don't want anyone to say to me after I put a penile implant in, I wish I had tried injections or I wish I had tried a vacuum device. And so if you're kind of mulling it around, you know, then I would try whatever you think, you know, might work for you. And then you'll know, I have some guys who, who try a single penile injection and are like, nope, not for me. And others who were skeptical that they would be, that, that the injections would be satisfactory. And I think they're pleasantly surprised um, that they get them the results that they're looking for. So really just depends on what fits with your lifestyle and what your goals are. Let's see. To touch on penile rehab, um, and you know that's really important, not even for, for those of you who have had prostate cancer and have had prostate treatment, it's really important for anyone who's not getting those regular nighttime and morning erections. And penile rehab, you know, technically it's we think about penile rehab as getting you the erections that you had prior to prostate treatment for prostate cancer and I think about it a little bit differently um, I think about it in terms of like an orthopedic injury and going to physical therapy is is physical therapy may not get you back to you know your shoulder before um, you injured your shoulder but you know the goal is to make your shoulder functional and and the goal in my sense you know for penile rehab is to optimize length, to optimize girth, and to get you the goals that you're looking for. And if you're deciding on ultimately how you want to proceed and get good erections for sexual activity, you know, my approach has been instead of saying, well, you know, I'm on your timeline and we can this, we can draw this process out five, 10 years. Just let me know what you're thinking. I'll see you back in six months. I'll see you back in a year. And so as you're trying to figure out, you know, are injections going to be your, your thing or is penile implant going to be your thing? You know, for those who want to be proactive, and, and, and minimize continued loss of length and girth over time, that's where penile rehab using a vacuum device on a regular basis can be really beneficial. So you're not taking steps backward and you might kind of be staying where you're at or even improving, but you're not gonna be getting worse in terms of the overall health of your tissue. 
And let's see, in terms of combo therapy, you can also get a little bit creative with that. We spoke a little bit about combining different types of oral medications, a shorter acting medication with a longer acting medication. You can also get a little creative when it comes to combining, you know, well, you can really combine a vacuum device with anything other than a penile implant. So you can combine a vacuum device with pills, a vacuum device with attention bands, a vacuum device with, with injections or urethral medication. So all that's good. And in terms of combining something like injections with pills, well, they actually work via different mechanisms. And um, so it can provide additional benefit if you combine something like, you know, an oral medication with a, like a low dose injection. Um, I, I reserve that for select people. Um, you know, there's, there's research out there that shows that combination therapy, you know, can work better than solo therapy. But I'll also say, depending on who your prescriber is, a lot of prescribers may not feel comfortable with combining therapies. Um, and I would never recommend doing anything against your prescriber's recommendations, especially because I don't know your situation and if you've had issues with prolonged directions before. Um, but in a safe environment where someone's kind of guiding you through that process, there are select scenarios uh, where we do combine medications. Yes, it is going to be off-label, and certainly there are, you know, some additional risks in terms of having that prolonged, um, uh, that prolonged painful erection if you go too high on the doses. And let's see here. I think we covered everything, Austin. Austin, do you have any burning questions remaining that you feel like I should address? I think you've hit everything. Okay, awesome. So, do you want to wrap us up? Yeah, absolutely. So with that, I'd like to thank Dr. Perlman for taking the time to present today. And we'd also like to thank everyone listening in for attending this MinMD Real Talk webinar. Uh, we hope it was informative and you'll join us again in the future. If you'd like to learn more, you have a few options here. Uh, there are more resources in the Resource Center on minmd.com. Visit this page to view instructional videos, guides, expert articles, and much more. You can also schedule an appointment with a MinMD clinical case manager. To do so, call MinMD at 857-233-5837 or log in to the Password Protected Secure MinMD portal. If you don't have a specialist for your sexual or urinary tract health, MinMD has a new physician finder service. Go to minmd.com and click find a physician to get started. And finally, you can learn more about penile implants and insurance coverage by visiting edcure.org. We'll also be sending a follow-up email with references to helpful resources and links to each after the event. I'd like to thank everyone again for attending today's webinar. We'll see you at the next one.